Yep. So for 3944, uh, I know you might not be familiar with the problem, it's the lighthouse one. Does this setup look right? All right. I'm not great with related rates. Oh, is this the one? Okay, I remember this one. It tells yeah. you how fast it's sweeping. Yeah. Let's see, three kilometers away, okay. I would do, okay, I would do from above. Oh, so flip, flip it? From above, because it's really, you want to be like above the lighthouse, so you can see the... Okay. That would be the best way to, to define, because then it's moving along the coastline. Yeah. You need to see that from above. Does that okay. make sense? So, yeah, just fix my triangle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you label it, things will be clearer what they want from you. Yeah, okay, okay. thank you. Sure. All right, guys, anything else from homework before we get back into this here? Okay, all right. Uh, past Jeff, what did you do with your pen? Oh. Well, damn, all right. Um, here we go. Use you. So, we did all of this work last time. We took a derivative, we found the critical numbers. Those are possible locations for maxes, local maxes, local mins. Yeah, that's right, we did. And then we did the sign diagram to identify local max, local min. Zero was a critical number, but it's just one of those resting places, right? We're just sort of rested for a second before continuing up. So it's not a max or a min. Blah, 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 blah. And we did the second derivative. We got those critical numbers. And then we, it's, it's almost the exact same work. It's just the interpretation of what we see is different. First derivative tells me is increasing or decreasing. That's why it leads to a max or a min. Second derivative tells me what? Concavity, I love it. And concavity just means how quickly the slope itself is changing. And so that helps me figure out where it's concave up, concave down, uh, and where there are might be any inflection points, places where it goes from cup down to cup up, for example. Okay, let me stop for a minute. Okay. So now that we've got everything, let me, let me kind of... Um, summarize everything we know here real quick from this problem. We know there's a min at negative one, negative two. We know there's a max at one, two. Uh, let's see what else we know. Blah, 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 blah. We know there's an inflection point at several places. Negative one over rad two. Actually, help me out. Let's write this better for doing this by hand. Um, so right here is the inflection points. What is one divided by rad two? Somebody help me out. It's point seven something, yeah. 707, 707? I don't know. Seven, I don't know. 1.41 divided by Point seven oh seven something. Seven oh seven? I like it. So we'll just say point seven because we're doing this stuff by hand. Negative one point two four. There's an inflection point at sorry, forgot the negative. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please help me out with I should have put a zero there, but too bad. Zero point seven, positive one point two four, and there's an inflection point at zero zero. Okay. And of course, these are the intercepts. All right, so what I'm gonna do, can somebody tell, oh, we did talk about this already a little bit. We made the scale a little differently than you normally would. Yes? Some of you guys don't remember, all right. 
be nice to yourself. You are picking the scale. I'm never going to give you the scale. You need to pick it, which means you could pick a very nice scale for yourself. If everything's happening like 0.7 and 0.9 and so forth, don't make your scale 246. I've seen that. Because then your picture comes out looking like this. Um, you know, everything's like jammed up in here. You can, you can blow that up for yourself. You can see it better. All right. So we did a little bit better scale. You could have probably done even better than that, but we'll, this is fine. What kind of scale do I want to use on my y-axis? It looks like sort of the biggest output I need to worry about looks to be in the twos, right? You guys with me? So maybe I can do the same thing for my y-axis. 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5. I think that's one of those overlooked graphing decisions um, as we teach it is the decision of what the scales are going to be. Now, obviously, everybody here knows the Y scale does not have to be the same as the X scale. It just seemed to be a good choice. So let's plot what we got. There's a min, negative one, negative two. When I plot it, I'm going to put the word min next to it so that I know as I'm graphing, when I get there, I'm going to turn around because that is the minimum. There's a max at 1, 2. You guys suck. Why did I write you there? It's too bad. Too late, Jeff. 1, 2. That's a max. Okay. There's an inflection point. Well, let me, let me do my intercepts. There's 0, 0. 1.29. Oops. So this would be 1.25 right in the middle. So 1.29 is about right there, maybe. Negative 1.29. So there's my intercepts. Do you guys know, is it going to go through or touch any of those intercepts? What's it going to do at each of those intercepts? Intercepts. Do you guys know? What? I'm sorry? Is it going to go through or touch at each of these? What did the zero come from? <clears throat> what piece? That's the third. It's, a, it's an odd power, so it's going to go through, right? This is squared, but didn't we effectively factor this? So would it be x and would it be a first degree? So it's going to go through all of the roots. OK, I like it. Now, obviously, real quick. If it would have touched and turned, what should have been true about that root? If it touches the root and turns, shouldn't that root? True, but, but just in terms of calculus, if it would have touched the root and went through and turned, what would have been true about that root? It would have been either or. I love you guys. It would be the location of a local min or max, right? Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? You guys with So if it's going to turn, it's going to look locally parabolic. It's going to have kind of a vertex, which is going to be a max or min for that local area. These go through, which is why none of the intercepts were local maxes or mins. Because it's going to go through each one. Okay, I like it. All right, what else we got? We got inflection points. Negative 0.7 and negative 1.24. It's about right there. That's an inflection point. And positive 0.7, positive 1.24. That's an inflection point. Okay, it's going to be exciting. And you can see, oh, past Jeff, you were such an asshole. Can you imagine if I had made my scale 1, 2, 3? Can you see how jammed up everything would be? It's already sort of jammed up. Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. So let's see, how do I start this off? Well, what's it start off uh, as? It starts off as decreasing, concave up. Right? Decreasing, 
but concave up, which is basically what I've got here. Yes? Did I say to find? No, I didn't. Okay. So it's going to be coming down like this. Now I've got to get, now you have to think ahead a little bit. I really want you guys, this is so jammed up. I should have picked a better scale than this, but too bad. So it's got to come down, it's going to go through, and it's got to get to the minimum, and then it's got to turn. Now, I, I, I wish I would have changed this up. It's too bad. I really want you to focus on what's important. It's concave up right, down, right now, right? It starts as concave up, correct? Okay. What's the first time it's going to become concave down? What point do I hit and it becomes concave down? Which point? What do I have it labeled as? What What is the name of the point where the concavity changes? Inflection point. So it's not gonna, it's right there, it's gonna change. So it's gotta be concave up, and then here it's gonna become concave down, which sort of makes sense. So if you label your points, you just have to say, okay, I'm starting decreasing concave up and then as you draw it says minimum I know I'm going to turn it says IP I know I'm going to change concavity right so I that's I, that's the last time I have to look at any of this shit I could just look at what I have labeled so again you can kind of see how everything's really tight here so it's going to come down it's going to be concave up throughout here and then it's going to become concave down Jeff, you really overdid that. I know I did. That's too bad. So now it's concave up here. Then it's going to be concave down. When does it become concave? Up. Did I forget to do? I did. All right. I forgot to label one thing, of course. And, and this is almost good that this happened because it's the labels that will keep you straight. Right? So what did it, anybody see what I forgot to label? What did I forget to label? How many inflection points do I have? Three. Three. Which one did I forget to label? Zero, zero. zero, zero. <laughs> All right. Okay, I really, this is a horrible choice on my part. I should have picked this better, so it was already sort of like uh, spread out a little more, right? Again, this is a really good illustration of picking a good scale. And I didn't label this. I want you to realize, uh, and again, I, I could claim that I did that mistake on purpose, but I didn't. But my labels capture all the work I've done. So as I'm doing the graph, the label tells me what the hell to do. I don't have to look back at my work. I forgot a label, I screwed up. So it's concave up, then it's concave down. And then, so what's it gonna look like as it goes through this point? It's gonna sort of look like a cubic. It's going to be concave down, and then right when it hits zero, zero, concave up. So concave down, and then concave up. And then what's this point I'm, I'm coming at? And that's an inflection point, right? So now it's going to come concave down forever. So it looks a little bit cubic in the middle. Again... I apologize for how squinched that was. So what could we have done differently? We could have maybe made this go by 0.25, but then let's see, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.25, 1 1.5, we have to get out. Yeah, that would have worked. So if we would have made this 0.25, it would have given me some more room to breathe, right? All right. So I'm gonna pretend like I did all that on purpose, just to show you if you pick a bad scale. <laughs> If you pick a bad scale, it's way too squunched, and then it's really hard to get your concavity to show up correctly because you're trying to turn really quickly. Okay, okay, let's start fresh. Um, let's, do, let's do one more example, and then I want to talk about 4-4 four, because four, you'll notice it sort of skips 4-4. Four, four. But I want to immediately do one more example. With Isn't it the same one? Wait a minute. I have a I have a worksheet somewhere. Do, do, do. Oh, I really hope.
quite put it in That you? Yes, that's you. Okay. So yeah, I have one another worksheet. I think we'll do the second one first. Turn it over to the second dude, little natural log dude. Okay. How are you going to find the domain of this? Set the inside greater than zero. Say again? Set the inside yes, good. All right, so natural log. So whenever I ask you, I give you a function to say find the domain, can you say in English what that function's problem is, right? So what's the problem natural log has? It can't handle zero or less. So the inside has to be greater than zero. Now one really nice thing about cubic functions is they have one real kind of solution and two complex solutions. So I can actually just do exactly what you wish you could do. Are you guys, if I pull this over, do you guys see how I get to here? So then I could do the cube root of both sides. So x less than two, all right. So this can only go up to, not quite, to 2. I like it. It's got to make sense. 8 minus shit, so the shits better be negative some, most of the time, so that the result's positive, so the natural law can handle it. So this makes sense. It's only a few positive inputs it can handle. Okay, is everybody cool with that? Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. So I just added the x cubed, right? So, so let's see. And then flip the whole thing. Yeah, it's a nice way to do. Or you could subtract the 8, divide by negative, and the sign flips, right? Okay. Take a minute and do part B. And again, don't forget on a test or a quiz, if I give you, if they show this is the derivative and you can't do it, let it go. You can do the rest of the problem because they told you what the derivative is. pretty straightforward. What's the derivative of ln of something? One over that something times derivative of the inside, which is just negative 3x squared. Is everybody cool if I brought that negative down? That's how I change this around? Okay. All right, that wasn't horrible, hopefully. What are the critical numbers? Zero. Yeah, it, it would be zero and two, Right? Zero because that's what makes the derivative zero. Two because that's what makes the derivative undefined. But what's true about two? It's not even. It's 
It's not even in our domain, right? So there would be a critical number of two if that was even a part of our domain. So, yeah. So you're not necessarily wrong if you list it, but you want to realize you can cross it through so it doesn't even come into play in your analysis later. All right. So let's make a Wait, sign. Zero wouldn't be there either. Why not? What do you mean? What's the domain? No, 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 no. I mean, natural log of eight is fine. Okay, okay. All right. How are we all feeling so far? So it looked a little funky, the function, but the steps don't give a shit. The steps are always the same. Make a sine diagram. So now I've got my, so I'm gonna put two up here. It's kind of like our wall. I put zero here, so this is draft. This is hard, can't go past this shit. Uh, zero is where the derivative is zero. Let me see, does anybody see how? Well, let's see what you guys think. Zero came from something that's the second power, right? So it's going to be the same sign on both, but. Even if you don't see that, if I plug a one in, I get three over negative, so that's negative. If I put a negative one in, I get three over negative, so that's negative. Is everybody cool with that? And of course, what am I looking at? I'm looking at my F prime, because that's what tells me increasing, decreasing, all the kind of stuff. I like it. What does that mean about this function? It's almost everywhere it exists, it is decreasing. And why do I say almost anywhere? Because, of course, at zero, it's not doing shit. So it's decreasing from negative infinity up to zero, zero to two, and it's not increasing anywhere. Nowhere. Does it have any local maxes or mins? Nope. The only critical number, the only possible location of one it's going down and then still going down after that. So that's not a max or a min. It's just a resting point. All right, so the exciting one, of course, the part you've all been waiting for, considering the first derivative looks like this, you should have known the second derivative is going to be a trip. So go ahead and take that trip. Show that this derivative is that. Let's all see if past Jeff knew what the hell he was doing. Oh yeah, bam, Jeff. So it looks like all the weird stuff happens with the second derivative. You guys get that okay? Yeah, so real quick. 
right? Bam, this will be 6x to the 4th minus 9x to the 4th, and then minus 48x, so you can take out a negative 3x. There's your x cubed, x cubed plus 16. Okay. All right, I like it. How many critical numbers will this thing have? How many? Maybe. It depends on, yeah, there, there's possibly three, right? But, of course, at least one of them is not going to be part of our domain. So what does this one give us? Two, and of course that's the one we can throw out. It's not in our domain. I like it. This one's easy. Zero. Right, so this two is what makes it undefined, which is a critical number because that could be the location of a max or a min or, or it could be where concavity might change. But we throw it out. It's not in our domain. This guy gives me a zero because that makes this zero. And then one last one, the really, really, really pretty one. Yeah, I like it. So it would be negative cube root of 16. Right? Negative cube root, if you solve this, equal to zero. Please tell me the minute I lose you. But, yeah. So when is the bottom zero? That makes it undefined. When is the top zero? Right? It's zero at zero. It's zero when this is zero. Subtract 16. Take the cube root. Which you can rewrite as... Uh, in whatever, I don't care. What would this actually be? Give me a estimate for that. 2.52? Okay. Approximately. Show the second derivative. This guy? So derivative of the top, bottom, minus top, derivative of the bottom over the bottom square. And of course, bam, bam, yeah, okay. You can sing whatever song you want to. Okay. Now, let's investigate with a side diagram. Side diagram. So I've got my hard wallet too. Beep, 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 zero and negative 2.52 okay let me stop for a minute so as ugly as the numbers might get since I'm making you graph this by hand you're going to just make them into approximate decimals anyway they're not going to be that horrific right um, so how do I investigate this? Same way as always, right? If I plug a 1 in, let me see if you guys, if I plug a 1 in, let's see, critical number, no, get out. If I plug a 1 in, this will be negative, yes, negative, times positive, divided by positive, because it's squared, I like it. So it's negative here. If I plug a negative one in, this will be positive times positive over positive. So that's positive. And if I plug a negative three in, are you guys? Okay, all right. Because again, I don't care about the numbers. I just care about the signs, which is kind of nice. Plug a negative is going to be positive times Negative 3 cubed is negative 27. That's going to be negative, and that's going to be always positive, so this is negative back there. You could have also realized that the roots came from odd powers, odd multiplicities, so it should change signs everywhere. Okay. All right, all right. So what does this mean? Are there any inflection points? Yes. So there's one at negative 2.52, right? Now, when you, when you put this in your calculator to figure out the output, what should you put in place of x? The actual number. 
The actual number. I love it. So somebody help me out. What's the natural log of 8 minus? Now this is beautiful, yes? What's the cube root of 16 cubed? 16. That kicks so much ass. So this is 8 minus negative 16. 8 plus 16. Natural log of 24 is roughly... 3.18. 3.18? Does everybody understand that? So we're going to graph this by hand. We're going to approximate it. But if I'm plugging shit in, I better plug the actual number in. And then there's another inflection point at zero. That promises to be 2.08. Okay. Makes sense. <coughs> and then, of course, real quick, did I forget that? No, I didn't. Okay, good. Uh, I always forget the decreasing, increasing, but that's this time I started with concave up from negative two five two to zero, and concave down. Trust me, that's what it says. Negative infinity to negative two point five two zero to two. Now, to be honest, what I just wrote is not really going to help us necessarily, but it's part of what I need you to be able to interpret from what you've done. All right. Now, now, just so you know, you guys all understand, this is not an easy function necessarily, right? But I desperately want you to realize it got ugly in a few places, but it didn't really matter. We could approximate them. Every step stays the same as always. Right, And now the last thing is, can we find intercepts? How am I going to find the intercepts of this function? So here's my function again. What's the y-intercept? No, zero. 2.08, yeah. Yeah, that's right. All right, natural log of 8, which is 2.08. Somebody with that? So if I put a zero in for x, natural log of eight is 2.08. We already knew that, right? That's my y-intercept. My y-intercept happens to be one of my inflection points. What's my, how do I find my x-intercept? <laughs> yep, yeah, set this equal to zero. How the shit do you do that? There you go. Can the natural log equal zero? No. So are there any x-intercepts? No. Okay. I like it. Now be careful. Can the natural log be zero? Let me make sure you guys are with me. You just took me down the wrong path, and I totally went there with you. What's the natural log look like? So what are you thinking about that it can't be zero? What can't be zero? The output can't be zero. Yeah. Okay. So this one's trying to say the output zero. So now I'm back with it. Okay, so this one's got no. Um, so no x-intercepts. Bam. So now if I, you guys are going to help me label everything. Because if I, if I don't label something, I'm going to get the wrong answer. Right, because the labels actually hold all the information for me. So let's plot some stuff. Uh, what kind of scale? The very first thing I've got to worry about is my scale. And it looks like my outputs are all kind of like two, three. My inputs are negative two stuff, right? Let's look up here. Yeah, there's nothing really up here for me. There's no maxes or mins. So I could probably go by ones, it looks like. Yes? Yes? OK. So let's go by ones. This kind of sucks. <laughs> I mean, you should bring your own a graph paper, because I could have put this axis over here. But too bad for all of us. Um, so I've got. So everything's happening below two. It looks like I could do my scale on the y-axis by ones. All right. So let's kind of identify some points. I can plot my y-intercept. 0, 
What does that also happen to be? Yes, yeah, by inflection points. Let me put a little IP next to it. Yep. So that's my only intercept. Let's graph the other inflection point, negative 252, 3.18. There's an inflection point there. All right, and I don't have any maxes or mins to work with, right? This thing is always decreasing. Okay, so one thing I could do that I didn't do before, I don't think I'm gonna do this anyway. I could put like a negative four in to see where it is, but let's not do that. So what gets me started is I know I begin, I'm always decreasing, so that's just a known. But I start concave what? Down. Down. So I'm going to be coming into this sucker like this, decreasing concave down. And then what's going to happen right when I hit this point? Concave up. I'm going to go through this point. And then it's an inflection point again. So then I'm concave down. Uh, let me see. Where can I put an open circle? Here's one thing we need to figure out. Two is not in the domain, but what happens when I approach two? What does happen when I approach two? Yeah, because the inside goes to zero, so the whole thing should go to negative infinity. So there's a asymptote here. So that's one thing that section four or five is going to add. It's going to bring back vertical and horizontal asymptotes, maybe some slant asymptotes. Yay. Yeah, let me think. Hold on, hold on. That's what I was worried. Ba, 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 ba. But it's not on the domain, so technically doesn't it Wait just get really close to two? Ln of one is zero. Yeah, ln of one is zero. That's what I was. Yeah. All right. I'm I'm being unbelievably dumb today. So this is what I was trying to point out. So ln you can't have an input of zero, but you can have an output of zero. So how do I solve this? I love when I make really silly mistakes like that. What would this be? How would I do this? What's the base here? And this is, you know, all right. I can't go back in time, unfortunately. I just made a really big mistake. I'm going to own it fully. But I love, like you just said, if I know I've got to have an asymptote here, I know there's got to be an x-intercept here. So then I can go back and go, well, I was silly for a minute. There is a way to solve this because what is e to the zero? One. And then I can solve that, right? So x cubed equals seven. Is that cool? And so what's the cube root of seven roughly? 1.91, and that makes a lot of sense because then it can be right up close to that and just get closer and closer. Okay. All right, so let's do this. So I know I'm coming in, I'm decreasing, and I'm concave down. So I know I'm coming in like this. And then it becomes concave up. And a lot of times what I do is I start from the other side just to make sure that it's up there. And then I become, what happens after this point? Now I'm concave down. And I'm concave down forever because there's no more inflection points. Funk. And it's a little overpronounced here. And like I said, you want to really be really clear with your picture about the concavity, which is why you want to give yourself some more room to show that. Yeah. If you didn't graph the x equals 1.91, you'd be getting the Well, 
you like we like just happened we know since it's decreasing and there's an asymptote i have to go through the x-axis right. then you go back and you say my assumption there was no x-intercepts must have been incorrect let me look at this again so it's sort of like a self-check and there's a lot of that kind of thing with these as you're doing something it might not make sense and then you go where'd that come from let me look at what i did right that's going to happen a lot where you have a self-check and of course if you don't pick up on it you will retain more points the more your graph looks like the work you did right if your graph looks beautiful and your work is wrong that's a major issue you're going to lose more points okay now of course how do you check this you just graph the damn thing in your calculator right you can always do that but i highly recommend you do that after you've actually got a graph down because otherwise it's going to creep in your head and you're going to do weird shit that i'm like how did you know that wait a minute okay maybe maybe okay so before we do this side, let's introduce something that some of you guys either, so I noticed a method creeping into people's homework that we officially don't know yet, which is one of the, the worst things about any math course, to be honest. Uh, when you get higher up in math, there's a math course I took where you could not assume that two was a rational number, or square root of two was irrational to me, or you had to prove, you couldn't assume one plus one is two. You had to pretend like you didn't know that and you had to actually prove it. How do you prove that? Oh, well, take real analysis and then, all right. Um, so in calculus, even if you know stuff like, if I, let me just say this, does anyone know L'Hopital's rule? We're doing it right now. It's in section 4.4. Oh, so if you've okay. tried to use L'Hopital's rule before 4.4, I have crossed through that shit because we don't officially know it yet. Now, sometimes it's not your fault. You go to a tutor, and I can't really blame them either because L'Hopital's rule kicks a lot of ass. You're going to see in a minute. How do you guys feel about finding limits? Can't they sometimes be horrific? Okay. L'Hopital's rule makes it so much easier. So if I was a tutor and I know this rule... And you come to me with a limit question from chapter two, I might try to show you this rule because it's easy. But they should really know better than that because you don't officially know that yet. Okay, okay. The idea, okay, so the idea behind this rule. So by the way, there is disagreement on how to spell this poor person's name. Oh, yeah, I have heard that. I know. The hospital, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. French, so I didn't really know. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. Sorry. As you should, though. Like, for sandwich. Last little. Last little rule. Um, you'll see sometimes they'll take the S out, and those people are wrong. Let's get this man's name right. Um, it's... Four, four? Sorry? This is 4-4. Four, four. Four. Yeah. So, okay. 4, 3, and 4, 5 are almost the same thing. 4, 5 just brings in more pre-calculus. It brings in vertical horizontal asymptotes, maybe some slant asymptotes, other things like that. Okay. 4, 4 is sitting right in the middle because this rule is actually used to talk about a few things in 4, 5 officially. Um, but you guys, all right. The, tell me this. If I have a function that is differentiable, so let's see, if I have f of x, and it's differentiable everywhere on its domain. On its domain. Okay, what does that mean if I take any point on the function and I zoom in a lot? What will I see? Straight line. It's going to become straight. Some of them, especially if they're like crazy curvy, I might have to zoom in more and more and more and more and more until it finally, but it's going to be locally linear. This idea of, and to be really honest, I'm not even sure if I've said it like this, but local linearity. You zoom in on this bad boy, it's going to look like a straight line. Where does that not happen is if it's not differentiable, like at a kink. 
If I zoom in on that, it's always going to look like the top of a triangle. It's just never going to be a straight line. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Now, let's say I'm trying to do the limit as x goes to some number of the ratio of two functions. Okay. So this idea is going to come into play very soon. There's kind of like three levels of proof to this. I'm going to start with the lowest level just to get the idea out there. Then we're going to get, look at the second level, and then I'll figure out if I want to try to do the ultimate level with you guys. We'll see. So visually, I've got some... Hey, and Oh, one more thing I want to say. Let's say that this is indeterminate in this way. It's of this form, right? So this function, so the f and the g, independently, they each are going to zero at a, right? And, and I think maybe, considering how poorly I draw, maybe I should use, yeah, that's fine, Jeff, you can do that. Uh, I didn't know if they had anything better, but I could do this. So the f function and the g function However they're going, are both going to zero at A. Maybe they don't exist at A because it's a limit. But they're both going to zero at A. And we're trying to figure out what the limit of that ratio is. right? So we've done these in the past, for sure, with no problem at all. So for example, we've done this kind of problem, which is exactly like what I've got set up up there. Isn't that exactly... This situation, because it's zero over zero, and of course, what do we know now that makes this easy? Indeterminate. Indeterminate, which means what do I do? Uh oh, all right. What do I what do I do? What do I do? Factor. factor, yes. I factor in the hopes that the problem, the thing that is making it zero over zero, I'm hoping that it will cancel. And then I'm able to plug stuff in. Okay. That's easy, right? Why do I need some rule, Jeff? This is easy shit. Because what about, for example, this? Right? Can I do that? How do you factor natural log of x? Huh? You can't. Or at least you can't. Nah. But, hey, sorry. Future math that you can actually rewrite natural log as a polynomial, but we're not, we're definitely not there yet. But okay, okay, forget what I just said. I can't do this problem the same way as I just did the other problem. But it's got the similar problem, right? It's like, well, shit, man, somehow I really should be able to maybe cancel that problem out, but it's just not so in my face. So here's the beautiful idea of this. These are both differentiable, yes? Obviously, yes. It's de definitely close to one. They're both differentiable, because you could argue this guy gets freaky at zero, but I'm nowhere near zero. I'm going to one. Yes? OK. Um, so close to one, aren't each of these things linear? The closer I get to one, what happens to the linear approximation? Does it get better or worse? If I do a linear approximation for each of those, and I get closer, I build it around one. As you get closer to one, what happens to the linear approximation? It gets better and better and better, right? And the limit that it goes to one is going to be perfect, yes? So can't I basically replace each of those with their linear approximations. Because isn't limits all about getting really freaking close to one? <clears throat> and isn't their linear approximations essentially equal to those things? Close to one. Let me stop for a minute. Okay, so. Yeah, I've just decided we're gonna do this all the way out. Okay. 
How do I get the linear approximation? Oh yeah, this will be a nice little review. All right. I wasn't going to do this, and I just suddenly decided to do this. You really want to? Yes, let's do it. That's a good review. How do I get this guy's linear approximation? Yeah, so I need, so the linear approximation is going to be f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, right? Now, of course, if I do it around 1, what's going to be the trouble? What is f of 1? That's not a problem. Oh, I'm overthinking. Okay. I'm, I just want to make, I hadn't done this before, so I want to make sure this is going to work. So we can do this, right, where I want a to be 1. Okay, let me stop for a minute. You guys remember this linear approximation? We're going to try to get this. What is f of 1? 0. Zero. What is f prime of x? So what is f prime of 1? One? 1. I like it. So then what's the linear approximation? It's going to be 0 plus 1 times x minus 1. Yes? So it's going to be x minus 1. I like it. So watch this. So if I do, now, now please, dear God, listen to me, listen to me. Do you guys understand what I just said? I didn't have to do this, right? I just wanted to for a concrete example here. You're not going to have to do this on any problem. There's a much quicker way to do this. I just wanted to, I, I don't know. Uh, so if I replace, now listen, I really want this to make sense. As you get closer to one, this becomes more valid. This becomes a better and better approximation. So I can basically replace this with this. And of course, what's that limit? Freaking one. So that's what the limit of that is. So A is one, F of A is zero, F prime of one is one. You plug this stuff in, so the closer I get to 1, the more natural log of x is equal to x minus 1. So in the limit, I can replace this, bam, bam. Now, do you want to do, yes, yes. So we said that f of 1 is indeterminate. No, 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 careful. That's the thing I was tripping up on just a minute ago. It said the form, isn't this in the form uh, 0 over 0? Yes. Okay. What's f in this? In this, what is f? No, 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 no. No. What's f? Okay. Yeah. So f of a in this case is zero, and it's because the bottom is also zero that the whole thing is indeterminate. But each function I can work with separately. Okay, I like it. I like it. I like it. That's actually a huge point to make about the rule that we're going to see in a minute. So what's kind of like, okay, we're not going to do this. Because you can imagine, what if the top was gross and the bottom was gross? Do you want to do a linear approximation for each? Because they could be excessively gross. No, I don't want to have to do a linear approximation for the top and the bottom for every damn problem. Dear God, Jeff. Okay, so here's a better way to look at this. Okay. So if I have this situation... And f and g are differentiable close to a. And we all know close to a means something like um, a minus delta, a plus delta. Yes, maybe? Ooh, just to bring delta back. We all love that. It's trying to be a delta, poor little dude. All right, now watch this. I can effectively replace these, let me see if you guys are cool with this, with f prime basically that's what we just did. The linear approximation for this would be the slope times x minus a, slope times x minus a. 
So then what happens to the X minus A's? They cancel. And then you can evaluate this. So what we just saw, and I've sort of built up to this point, limits are determined by which one is going to something faster. Limits are determined by the rate of change of each function in it. L'Hopital's rule is basically capturing that idea very freaking directly. The limit of a ratio of functions is equal to the limit of the ratio of their derivatives. Right? And you might say, oh, okay. <laughs> So... So let's try, okay, let's try some examples. Let's do that last one we just did. Here's an example. So here's the key thing to realize. When does L'Hopital's rule work? If the function ratios I'm looking at are in an indeterminate form, that is when it works. The minute they are not indeterminate, L'Hopital's rule might not work anymore. So what is that? Okay. So somebody help me out. How would I do this? So here's the thing I was trying to say earlier why it's kind of nice that it came up that we can look at each function separately because you have to. What I get is I get some poor student who does the quotient rule on this thing. Holy shit. Right? They take this whole thing and they do quotient rule. That is not what we're doing here. That's not one function, is it? There's a top function and there's a bottom function. And I want to do each derivative separately. So what's the derivative of the top? 1 over x. What's the derivative of the bottom? 1. So what is this? 1. Isn't that what we got earlier? Didn't we do that a lot quicker now? So this gets to the point. I don't need the complete linear approximation. I just need their slopes. If I do the complete linear approximation, it's going to work. But good God, there's so much more work. This is kick ass. Look at that shit. I really, and by the way, let me be really careful. I should have done this from the very beginning. Anytime I would do L'Hopital's rule, I put a little LH for myself. Because otherwise, you might look back at this and say, and your brain might say, oh, ln is equal to 1 over... No, I, I applied L'Hopital's rule, bam. Could I apply L'Hopital's rule again to this? No. Why not? It's totally not indeterminate, right? So L'Hopital's rule says, if you try to use me and it's not indeterminate, I don't know what the shit's going to happen. I can't guarantee anything. Can you sometimes get the right answer? You... Totally. Really? To yeah, entirely. Totally, totally. But L'Hopital says, maybe you'll get the right answer? I don't know. Because it's absolved of all... <laughs> all uh... Yeah, exactly. Because it only definitely works if it starts off indeterminate. So do you think you're going to have to do possibly multiple derivatives sometimes? Yeah. Of course, right? So for example... What do you got, Jeff? I don't know, Jeff. Sure. Uh, um, that's not going to work. Let me think for a second. I'm trying to make one that's neat. Uh, let me think. Yeah, okay, I'll just do that. Sure, I like. Okay. Yeah, buddy. All right. So, is this? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Listen. listen. Right, I love it. I love that question. Um, limits exist by themselves. They, they, they are just an idea. I can use them in a lot of different ways. Are they used in determining derivatives? Yes. If 
I have f of x plus h minus f of x over h, but the limit as h goes to zero. In that very specific instance, they lead to derivatives, right? We have a limit that has nothing to do with derivatives, right? This, this question, there's nothing at all explicitly about derivatives. This is not h goes to zero. This is not f of x minus f, you know, f of x plus blah, blah, blah. Do you guys, so I love that question because um, it, is kind of, it kind of sucks in calculus that we so immediately after discussing limits, we jump right into using them to find derivatives. So students sometimes think limits go with derivatives. No. Limits are their own things. One very specific use is to find derivatives. I like it. Thank you. Okay. So what form is this in? Zero over zero. And I didn't make this good enough, did I? No. Damn it. So <laughs> I give myself lasha. So if I just do one L'Hopital, what's going to happen? So this is zero over zero. It'll be e to the x over minus 2x. Yes? How do we know it's 0 over 0? Oh, because if you plug a 0 in, don't you get 1 minus 1? Yeah. That's 0. And if you plug a 0 in, you get 0 on the bottom? Yeah. Okay. Do I, am I allowed to use it again? No. Why not? What form is this in now? One over zero. I love you guys. Yeah. Now, what's funky about this? Can you guys just tell me that the answer is infinity? It goes to infinity. You sure? I, lo I love you guys so much. Could it go to negative infinity, maybe? No. What do you mean? No, come on. You guys are better than this. No. Why not? So. The top is one. The bottom is going to zero, but is the bottom always negative or is it always positive? You guys understand what I'm saying? So stay with me now. This is the key. This is huge. This is from before. Just because it's one over zero, that means the bottom is going to zero, but is it always positive as it goes to zero? Positive infinity. Is it always negative as it's going to zero? Negative infinity. Right? What's the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x? Does not exist. Because if you go from above, it's positive infinity. If it goes from below, it's negative infinity. Are you guys? Because all the x's are negative from below, and it's always positive from above. So that's why the freaking picture looks like that. So what's happening here? You guys are all like, oh, look, it's all great. No, well, now this is determinant. I know it's some kind of infinity, but then you've got to slow down. So I'm kind of happy I made this problem. Um, if I go from above, this is going to be always positive, right? And if I go from below, not always. Okay, it's not always. Why? Well, if you factor in, you get x times 3x minus 2, and then uh, eventually 3x minus 2 will become negative. Yeah, I love this. I, I would like this problem. So there is a place. So as it goes to zero from above, doesn't it change signs at two thirds? Yeah. So when I get really close to zero, so from below, if the x was negative that I was plugging in, this would be negative times negative. That's positive. From, so from below, it looks to be going to positive infinity. From above, this is positive times negative, negative infinity. So this actually does not exist. Crazy shit. Yes, because it's doing one of these things. So that's sort of like a holdover from earlier this semester where if it's o some number over zero, you can't automatically say it's infinity because it could be negative infinity or could be kind of both, which means nothing, which means it doesn't exist specifically. Okay, man, I am picking some really good problems. All right, <laughs> let's see if I can make one. Hold on, let me get it.
one that's gonna do what I want it to. Bum, bum, bum. No. Ah, beautiful. Let's do this. So what do you guys think about this here? Is that what that says? No, it's a cube. Sorry, make that a cube. What form is that in? What's tangent of zero? Zero. zero. So zero minus zero is zero, and zero cubed is zero, so it's zero over zero. So what can I do? You can go to the hospital. Or if you're in England, you can go to hospital. So what do I get when I, what do you guys get when you take the derivative of the top here? Take ass. Oh, all right. This is why I need a little help from the book. Because what form is this in? What's secant of zero? One. <laughs> no. Secant is basically your reciprocal cosine, right? Yeah. Cosine of zero is one, so secant of zero is one. One minus one is zero. And the bottom is still zero. Now, real quick. All right. Um, see if the book even does this. No, the book just does that shit. Um... Does anyone know what secant squared x minus 1 is? Tangent squared. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, it's really up to you. You could rewrite this using that identity. And then you can do the derivative of tangent squared, which would still be uh, chain rule. You guys with me? Or, or not. It's up to you. So let's pretend like we didn't see that. But just to let you know, if you have trig functions in this, and you take derivatives, very often an identity might help you simplify it. I think in this case, it sort of doesn't do that much for us. Um, so if I do another application, so why am I allowed to do another application of L'Hopital's? It's still indeterminate. So L'Hopital, so again, every time I do a derivative, it's like I'm starting over. Here is a problem I could have given you. I could have asked you this problem. This is where I could have started. It's indeterminate, I could use L'Hopital's. It doesn't matter what came before. It is currently in a form that that rule works for. So, what the hell is the derivative? So, I'll do this. I'll do the minus one. That's zero. You're welcome. How do I do the derivative of secant squared? Kind of gave it away a second ago. I have to use what rule? Chain rule. So, the two comes down times secant times the derivative of the secant, which is secant tangent. I love it. Secant tangent. Secant tangent function. Okay. Thank you for that. I like that joke. Okay. <laughs> I don't give a shit if nobody likes And on the bottom, I get crazy. What form is it in now? God damn it. Uh, two secant squared x tangent. True. So I can put those together. What's tangent is zero? Zero. It was six times zero? Zero. <laughs> <Still>? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, man. Oh, that was too good. Uh, let me see. What weird shit did they do? Oh, I see. They did some weird shit. That's fun. I can show you one little thing. Let's kind of... Let, does everybody agree with me that I really don't want to take this guy's derivative now? Yeah. So let me let me do this. Uh, you guys cool with that, right? Yeah. What's the the limit? So let me see. Let me rewrite this. 
Uh, do I really want to do this? Well, yeah, because you guys should see this. What was the, what, so the limit, so this is the reason this is zero over zero, right? You guys agree with me? This stupid thing here? What's the limit as x goes to zero of this piece? One. So now I've got this. Because this is one. Because I can break limits up, right? Do you see that? That's nice. Does everybody agree with me that that's nice? Because now I don't have to do product and chain and shit, right? So now I can do L'Hopital's again, because this is still zero over zero, yes? Derivative of tangent is secant squared. And derivative of 3x is 3. All right. <laughs> right? The minute you see a constant somewhere, you're like, okay. So everybody, you guys should love L'Hopital's, but at the same time, you're like, oh my God, is it ever going to stop? Sometimes you got to be careful. But each time you do it, stop. Are there any identities? Is there any piece I could do the limit of so it gets out the way? Oh, how I got here from here? Yeah. Oh, uh, 2 over 6 is 3. Secant squared. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just simplified stuff. And put some. Yeah, if x goes to 0, secant goes to 1. So real quick, um, tell me this. Little side note, don't even write this down. What's the limit as x goes to two of x minus one, x plus seven? Nine. Yes, what did you do? Didn't you do the limit as x goes to two of x minus one times the limit as x goes to two of x plus seven? Yeah. Isn't that what you did? That's what I did here. And why did I do that? Because I don't want to do this derivative. And I don't have to because this guy's limit is 1. Yeah, I like it. Say again, sorry? It would go outside. I could put it outside, but yeah. It actually would probably be a little bit better to do that. Okay. And of course, what's this? One third. Catch him up. Where'd the three come from? Are you cool with the two and the six? Yeah, so it just reduced, yeah, I like it. Okay, okay, I like it. So if you, so for example, um, how would you have had to have done, let's do one that's here, yeah. How would you have had to do this back in the day that you don't have to anymore? Stop crinkling up, yeah, there. Ah, all right. Uh, what would you have to do? Factor it. But what can we do now? Yeah, uh, I'm not going to infinity. you got to be careful. What can I do now? Could I do L'Hopital's? Isn't it zero over zero? So if I apply L'Hopital's, what do I get? 1 over 3x squared, which is 1 over 27. Yeah. Funkadelic. So real quick, real quick, I would factor this as x minus 3, x squared plus 3x plus 9. These would cancel, right? And if I plug a 3 in here, I get 3 squared plus 3 squared plus 3 squared is 27. Nine, 9 plus 9 plus 9, I get the same answer, but I don't have to factor. Yes? Okay, all right. So L'Hopital's will work, and everything we've done before that was indeterminate. Oh, shit. One last thing I want to show you real quick. Um, where did I put my notes? Bum, 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 bum. Oh, yeah, I was going to prove it, but all right, a different way. Where's that one last thing? Do, 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 do. There it is. Okay. Oh, okay. What about this?
What form is that in? Do we know it's indeterminate yet? What must All right. L'Hopital's rule only works if I have something written in the form of a ratio, right? That's what it's built on. Is this a ratio? No. But is this determinant? No. This is in the form 0 times infinity. And it really depends on which thing is going to 0 or infinity faster. If the thing going to 0 is going to 0 faster, the limit might be 0. If the thing going to infinity is going to infinity faster, it might be infinity. Okay, meba, meba. And real quick, if you don't... Anybody who thinks this should always be 0, uh, look at this... Look at this uh, sequence. Uh, what do you want to do, Jeff? Yeah, sure. Is the result of this... Isn't this going to zero? Right? If I continue in this fashion, isn't that approaching zero? Isn't this approaching infinity? But every time I do this, isn't the result getting bigger? So what's the whole thing going to? Infinity. So if you thought just because there's a zero there, that the whole thing goes to zero, you're wrong because it's never equal to zero. This piece never equals zero. So it really depends on who's going faster. Doesn't that sound like exactly L'Hopital's point? It depends on who's going faster. But the problem, again, can I apply L'Hopital to this? No, it's not a freaking ratio. Everything's a ratio. Everything is. Why? Because I can take any piece of this stupid thing and flip it. Isn't that a ratio now? Is that the same function? Yeah. Yes. Do you guys understand that? Isn't multiplying by x the same thing as dividing by 1 over x? Yes. It's good old fractions. So I have a ratio now. What form is it in now? This is actually uh, negative infinity, but that's the same idea. So now it's in the form negative infinity over infinity. Is that cool? And I really didn't address this, but the, based on what we just did, L'Hopital's, I built it around zero over zero, right? In fact, let me say this real quick. God, so many little things. If this was infinity over infinity, and I built L'Hopital's around zero over zero, what is this? Isn't this the same? But now what is it going to? If this was going infinity, this is now going zero over zero, and then L'Hopital's works. Oh, so it will work even if the indeterminate form is infinity over infinity, and now it'll work for zero times some kind of infinity because I can rewrite that as a ratio. And then L'Hopital's can attack it. So what happens when I attack this with L'Hopital's? I still want to identify this L'Hopital's. One over X. One over X. Kick ass, right? But now what's pledging zero? Yeah. Now watch. What, before you fought, apply a limit, what do you try to do to the thing you're looking at? Don't you try to simplify it? Can't I multiply by x squared? Or even if you, what's divided by negative 1 over x squared? Isn't that times negative x squared, the reciprocal, right? So what do I get? I get limit as x goes to zero of negative x, which is zero. Wait, wouldn't it be, um, like if we tried to optimize it for what we call limit, be um, x over... One, one over ln x? Yeah. If you want to. Can you, so, the nice thing is, I kind of talked in here, I didn't really prove it, but I showed that if it is in this form, I can apply L'Hopital's rule directly to this because I could write it like this and it's doable. So now we've extended what L'Hopital's works for to zero over zero and infinity over infinity. If I did, I could have chose to leave the X up here, 
and made this go down here to be 1 over ln x. Can you guys understand that 1 over ln x derivative is going to be gross? Yes. Burr? Yeah. Right? So I want to flip the one that's easier to deal with because that doesn't matter. I can choose which one I want to flip. Yeah. Whew. Okay. All right. So next time we will kind of talk a little bit about pre-calc stuff just so we remember uh, asymptotes, slant or oblique asymptotes. Remember those? Because uh, this one... Anybody tell me what kind of, uh, does this have a horizontal asymptote? This one? What kind of asymptote does it have? Does anyone know? Yeah, it's slant. It's definitely got a vertical asymptote, but it doesn't really have a horizontal one. It's got a slant because the top power is higher than the bottom. Oh, yeah. All right, so next time we'll remember what the hell that is. Okay. Yes. Yes. Effectively, just I want to talk about those asymptotes. Yeah, so that's the last thing in four or five we got to talk about. Corrections for the test.